Good morning. It's a really a pleasure. Thank you, Patrick, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting when Patrick sent me an email telling me there's going to be the 20th anniversary in a great place called Porto. I was in Porto, so I, had, I didn't hesitate. I was for a, for a short uh, meeting here, and uh, I think that had the biggest uh, 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 in, uh, motivation to, to, be, to be back, and it's great to be here. Um, uh, my, my talk today is going to be a little bit going and uh, discussing some of the fundamental issues. It's easy because I, as you could hear, I work in a university and uh, we have a little bit of a more freedom to think uh, than, uh, than some of, uh, some of uh, others, other people. And uh, we already heard actually even in the previous talk uh, 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 this uh, quality of experience issue and uh, well one question really is uh, what is it? Is it just a hyped uh, nice buzzword uh, instead of QS or is it really something behind it? And this is really what I would like to, to talk about. Now in order to do that I need to, to visit and even revisit some of the uh, uh, even more fundamental issues. Things like uh, what is actually quality? Um, and uh, really where it is coming from, especially in the field of communications and particular telecommunications. And uh, things like how it is measured today and how should it be actually measured and uh, how people are planning to do that and what are the remaining challenges. This is, I, I'm hoping to cover that in about half an hour and uh, let's see how, how we go. Um, you know, uh, let me start with the quality. Quality, you know, something that we all understand. The problem is really defining it. And uh, it's something, um, it's not the only concept, but it's one of those concepts where it's uh, rather uh, easy to, to understand it as humans, but it's very difficult to define it in such a way that a, that a device or an algorithm can, uh, can actually uh, does the same thing that we really understand as humans of what, what, uh, what quality is. Of course, I'm not really referring to, to just definition of it because uh, there are definitions. You can go to any dictionary or, or encyclopedia, see that. And in fact, uh, there are even philosophers that believe that quality cannot be defined. So you know, I hope that we don't agree with them because otherwise my talk is completely superfluous. Um, uh, the origin of quality goes back, in fact, to, um, to ancient times uh, by people like uh, Aristotle, who, um, uh, who actually in his uh, seminar work uh, in philosophy uh, called Categories, uh, had identified quality as one of the 10 uh, objects of human apprehension. And in fact, uh, it's quite interesting how these people, uh, who are definitely very, very far from the world we are, um, uh, living today, uh, today in today, um, they actually have made some very very interesting points. If if you really have some time, uh, a little bit of uh, free time, please go and have a look at uh, categories uh, and especially what uh, Aristotle defines as quality. It's very very interesting, uh, and some of it is is actually literally applicable to a lot of things we do. Uh, of course, there are um, a lot of definitions of, of quality since then. Um, maybe without going into the details of, of what they are, uh, I would like to, to actually, uh, for those of you who have an interest, uh, uh, draw your attention that there is actually a white paper that tries to kind of you know, put together some of the most uh, um, widely used or popular use, uses of uh, what, is, what is quality. Um, but in a nutshell, really, uh, what is quality can be probably summarized in this. Do you know about this poem um, of the blind man and the elephant? It's the story of, a, of, a, of, um, of somebody who who, who, uh, who brings uh, some elephant to a village. Nobody has, has, um, has seen an elephant, but actually he puts the elephant in a dark room and tells people to go in the dark room 
and just touch the elephant. And then uh, people who are outside, they ask, so what is an elephant? And depending on where they touch, they define elephant dif differently. That's a little bit really what quality is. Depending on what is your application, what are your sensitivities, what you are doing, you define it differently. Now, the elephant is always there, right? Just that we, there are so many different perspectives of it that uh, sometimes they even look completely contradictory, if not very, very entirely different. So that's really the, the challenge we are facing. Now, let's narrow it down at least to telecommunication and see how in telecommunication quality is defined. Well, um, there are three already here, categories of uh, uh, quality that are defined in communication. I'm not going to uh, address some of them, but just let me just very, very quickly mention, mention them. One is the network quality. Now, I think the previous speaker uh, is very sensitive to this, among others. Um, these are issues like the coverage of the network, the capacity of the network, how well it does hands offs and things like that if it is a cellular network. Um, there is the linked one, which is less physical, but more at the, at the link uh, and uh, level that, 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 that can be measured by things like bitrate and um, how much delay you have or how many frames and bits uh, get lost, uh, um, et cetera. And then you have what is called the user quality and this is something that actually a lot of people nowadays are, are uh, rightly or wrongly confusing with what is quality of experience, which actually brings the user in the picture. Brings the user in the picture, and often it is some sort of fidelity metric that tells you how uh, uh, well the audio is produced uh, once it comes out of the network on the other side, opposite to the input, the output or video, et cetera. Um, now, really there is, there is a good, good reason why fidelity metrics actually were so dominant in telecommunication. The reason is very simple, right? These are some examples of networks. Doesn't matter what they are. Uh, what is important is that in telecommunication, the name of the game has been that you input some information on one side, nowadays it's more some bits that represent that information, and you output it somewhere else. And you have to optimize the system so that the input is as close as possible to the output. Right? And this is really the origin of, uh, of, um, of all these fidelity metrics that are around. This actually helped the um, telecommunications industry and research even in, in telecommunication to give itself some structure and define concepts like quality of service, right? Quality of service, we know that of course it's more than just defining quality, but uh, it also includes things like resource reservation and providing different priority for different pieces of information, but it is always optimizing, at least trying to, optimizing towards some guarantee of some quality or some performance. So the, the notion of the performance and, uh, and quality that should be guaranteed, in fact, because it is in the context of a network, and it wants that the input is as close as possible, or the output is as close as possible to the input, is by definition a fidelity metric. Now, uh, of course, uh, to do that, we need to have ways to, to measure that quality. And um, um, often, uh, because this really all started by people who were building the infrastructure for, for telecommunications, is very much actually provider-centric. So the concepts are very much provider-centric. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that the previous talk that has its title provider something, right, service provider perspective is wrong. I'm just saying uh, and observing that, in fact, a lot of things that have been happening in quality of service have been provider-centric. Now, it doesn't mean that providers ignore the needs of the, of the users, just that they try to guess what it is. And when you want to guess 
uh, what a, a user, a consumer wants, there are methods to do that. And many of them actually are around the notion of mean opinion score or uh, 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 MOS, right? Uh, MOS, in fact, there are many, many other areas than telecommunications where it has been used in marketing, politics, and etc. to know, you know, how likely is this or that politician or this or that political idea to be, to be, to be, uh, to be uh, approved. Um, and, um, and the same is true in, in the field of multimedia and multimedia communication. Uh, I try to at attempt at least to, to, uh, to define it, not pretending this is the best definition you can come up with, but it is something around uh, this kind of ideas. The likely level of satisfaction of a service or a product appreciated by average user of a typical situation. All right? And there are methods that, that have been devoted in order to do that. Uh, most of them, they, they try to be reliable and reproducible, right? And many of them are uh, actually based on subjective evaluation according to some methodologies. Now, for those of you who have not done that, you would say, oh, that's easy, right? I have a service or a product, I just ask some people, and then, you know, I have the mean opinion score. Well, it's a little bit more complex than that. For those of you who have done this kind of thing, you know that if you do it just like this carelessly, you just get garbage. You cannot get anything. So there are really some things that have to be, to be, to be, uh, to be well thought before we actually attempt to even do a, a mean opinion score evaluation. Let me, let me actually look at it a little bit more in details. And for, in, for, for, for doing that, I'm going to take a very, very simple example, and we walk through this example. I'm sure you have all seen many, many examples of bitrate versus mean opinion score of the quality of something. Could be audio, could be video, it could be uh, still images. In this case, let's take an still image. So some typical image has been compressed in such a way that uh, the bit uh, per pixel has been ranging from quite low uh, to, to, to some reasonably high. That translates immediately into some, uh, some level of perceived quality. So the more bits you are, uh, you, you, or the less compression you apply, the higher will be the quality, right? And these are the different colors or different uh, codecs, let's say. It doesn't matter what they are. And uh, usually they come with some sort of uh, confidence interval, right? Now, what is it? And how did we get there? And what is wrong with it? What is right with it? Well, actually, there are a lot of things that are wrong with mean opinion score. Uh, first of all, you need a ground truth, which means that there is actually an optimal solution available. Well, we know that you know, in many situations, especially multimedia, you cannot really say this is the best you can get. It depends on how you captured it, in which conditions, and et cetera, right? Um, it actually, uh, mean opinion score, because it is some sort of mean, it defies user preference. I'm going to get to that. Um, it ignores some, some key parameters, especially regarding content and context. And actually, it is often misused as a means of co uh, comparison. And last but not least, it's often in, impractical or expensive. And if you like math, many, many times it's actually uh, uh, making statistical assumptions that are not realistic. Let me walk you through each of them, okay, very quickly. Uh, oh, you don't see that very well, but uh, actually, the issue of ground truth. What is a ground truth? These are results, sorry you cannot see, of two um, um, uh, evaluation, uh, subjective evaluation labs that are um, doing exactly the same evaluation of quality of some image compression. Actually, in this case, it's video compression. And we are actually comparing them. So horizontally here, you have one of them. Actually, it happens to be my university. And vertically, you have the results of exactly the same thing 
carried out by some other uh, people, in this case, it's University of British Columbia in Canada. Of course, ideally, you want it to be exactly the same, a straight line. We see it's not. Right? So in fact, this, this idea that subjective valuation is the ground truth is actually not that true, right? These, 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 uh, these, these graphs show you very clearly that if you repeat the same experience, it's not as repeatable as we think it is. So it's not as, as ground truth, as important, uh, uh, as, as, as fixed, and as ideal as we think it is. Mean opinion score, by definition, destroys individuality, right? Well, as human beings, we have different sensitivities, we have different preferences. Some of us prefer something that some other actually don't. And a mean opinion score actually completely scraps that, right? It just averages. Content, in this case, but also context, can have huge influence on the result of a uh, mean opinion score. Here, I'm showing you mean opinion score versus the bitrate, like we saw before, but for different type of content. Now, often, you average, so this is the solid line in the middle, is what you get. But in fact, if you change the, 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 um, the content, you see that you can have actually a very, very large variation of, uh, of this mean opinion score. So the content that you use to measure the mean opinion score and actually, in a more generic way, the context in which you do that can have a lot of influence on the, on the, on the result. And talking about context, it's amazing, very trivial, what I'm telling you, but somehow nobody actually uh, is paying attention enough to it. There are so many different situations where multimedia is consumed. Often, decisions about which codec is better than which codec, which approach is better than which approach, is in a lab environment that is very controlled because you want to control all the parameters, but in fact, they are then used in completely different situations. I have first-hand uh, experience of that um, when MPEG decides uh, which codec among various possibilities of HEVC, H.265, should, be, um, uh, should become the standard. It doesn't really take into account this kind of situation where it, it would be actually used. It takes into account situations like that. And actually, this is the picture of where exactly this test was done. So you are deciding which codec should be used in future, let's say, multimedia, mobile multimedia uh, uh, applications, but actually you sit people in front of a, a screen like this in a dark room, which is very much different from a situation like this. Is this going to hold? So you make actually your, your decision based on something that is not really matching where the actual deployment will be done. Of course, not only the subjective evaluation of the mean opinion score has, has a lot of problems, even the objective metrics that come out, uh, out of it is, uh, that, that try to, 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 to predict these kind of things is, has many problems. Well, uh, of course, we know that there are many methods to do that. I don't want to uh, go uh, uh, through that uh, really in, in general. Uh, there are lots of actually uh, methods that have been devoted into, into, into predicting the mean opinion score. Um, PSNR is one of them. Let me just, uh, instead of telling you actually what, uh, what is wrong with it, first give you an example and then, and then tell you what they are. The example is a true uh, situation. Uh, in fact, MPEG a few years back um, created um, a compression standard uh, as an extension of H.264 called uh, MVC. Uh, multi-view coding uh, that was uh, supposed to be better than, than, than coding uh, each of the views independently. And uh, MPEG itself, that this is coming from official documents of MPEG, uh, shows that, for instance, for different bit rates, if you measure by PSNR, the quality of the new codec MVC versus the multicasting of each of the views, you get better results. And if you actually uh, make the calculation, you get, and this is what MPEG basically was saying, you get about 25% gain. 
Okay? Well, 25% is not much, right? You don't want to change codec just for 25%, right? Now, Hollywood actually got interested in that for Blu-ray, and uh, they created actually their own way of evaluating, but they evaluated it in, uh, in a subjective way. And they could actually show, I don't want to go into the details of it, but that you could actually get as much as 75% gain. So MPEG that created the technology and standardized it was selling it by saying it gains 25%, and some other people are saying actually it does much more. What's, where's the problem? The problem is that PSNR was the wrong metric. Okay. So objective evaluation uh, methods actually have a lot of problems. In fact, not only uh, we know that uh, B, uh, PSNR and metrics like this have a poor performance to predict mean appearance score in general. In fact, the world is color. We don't even know how to take the color, PSNR of color. It's just very interesting, right? All images, all video are color nowadays, right? We don't know how to measure it. Should we just uh, weight them equally? Should we give less or more? Yeah, it's such a fundamental problem, there is no answer to it, okay? Uh, same for video. How do you, do you take the frame PSNR's average, do something else? And also it doesn't take into account the context, right? PSNR by definition doesn't take into account how it is displayed, uh, in which situation, et cetera. So these are all, you know, uh, big, big problems even with the uh, uh, um, objective metrics that try to get the mean opinion score. So where to go? Well, in fact, this is where maybe there is an alternative way to go around uh, these kind of shortcomings. And this brings us actually to, to user-centered evaluations. So saying, well, don't average on people. People are different. Situations are different. Contexts are different. You have to take these things into account when you want to evaluate things. It's wrong to average. And this is, this is basically an example of how you can define the quality of experience that not only is dependent on some technical factors that are, in fact, present in PSNR and things like that, but also some other context like which application you are in, which context you are in, and what is even your expectation? What is the type of content you are, you are, you are dealing with, and even in which environment you are situating yourself? Now, quality of experience has been defined in many, many ways in the last 10 years. Again, for the interest of time, I don't want to go through all them, but um, uh, rather than that, I want to actually give you a perspective of how quality of experience is different from quality of service. Because many people, they actually use them as like some sort of buzzword, better, sexier word to say the same thing and do the same thing they were doing before. Well, the big, biggest difference actually is that quality of experience as opposed to quality of service is about the value of a specific user's richness of experience. So here you are really taking into account that particular user, not the average user. This is really putting this, the user at the center. How do you do that? There are many ways to do that. This is one model that exists that, uh, of quality of experience that has some attributes that can be user uh, centric, like uh, what, uh, individual attributes, like what is the sex and age and et cetera of people, uh, how well are their sensory attributes, uh, uh, even what their emotions are. You have some system attributes that are basically things you all know about, and contextual uh, uh, attributes that, that basically say which kind of content you have, which kind of device you have, which kind of environment, et cetera, right? Going back to our previous speaker, well, it's nice to have anywhere, anytime, any, anything, any device, et cetera, but, well, you cannot make one that fits all, right? You have to take these things into account in order to come up with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, a, with, with an optimal solution or close to optimal solution for each of the situations. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, designing a horse, in, a, a camel instead of a horse, right? I'm sure you know that. Now, there are methods that can be done, and since we don't have time, uh, uh, I just want to go very, very quickly through them. 
One way you could actually uh, really use this concept of qualitative experience is to do evaluations that are based on persona or scenarios. What does it mean? It means that don't make evaluations in a lab and then use it in, a, in, 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 in another environment. And uh, two examples I can show you. One is, for instance, this is for um, actually streaming of some mobile, uh, um, uh, streaming of video on mobile environment. So you, you actually put a lot of probes actually on, 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 on people and just get them, you know, uh, go and use the, the stuff, gather data, and based on that actually uh, have data and clues about how to optimize the system. Uh, this is another one, which is actually very interesting. Um, uh, how actually on a mobile device, uh, the 2D versus anaglyph 3D versus motion parallax 3D versus autoresceroscopic 3D uh, can, be, can be evaluated. Here, PSNR doesn't even work, right? Some of these things are 2D, you know, 3D. You cannot even PSNR between what and what, right? So in this case, for instance, you can get, based on these kind of methodologies, actually very interesting results. Here, I just want to show you here uh, on the left, um, uh, you have the 2D, and this is what is the quality of experience you get. And then this is the autoestroscopic, this is uh, the motion parallax, and this is anaglyph. In fact, if you look, you see that 2D quality actually is higher sometimes than autoestroscopic solutions. Definitely more than this, right? So, in fact, you don't need, when you see this kind of results, you don't need to actually deploy, spend millions, and find out that people actually don't like 3D. Okay? People don't like 3D in mobile environments with technologies and representation of 3D that are today the case. I'm not talking about movie theaters, I'm talking about 3D mobile. It doesn't work. Why? Because people say it. Okay? Now, you could also go spend 100 million and have the same result when the, everything is burned and some people get fired and everybody is, is unhappy. So what are the trends in quality of experience? There are lots of actually challenges. I just want to go and give you um, maybe some of the key ones. Uh, today, of course, research is going on, but we are not yet there. We need really um, content-dependent quality assessment methodologies. Methodologies that really take into account content and also context. Uh, a lot of ITUR standards are actually not doing that. And um, you need also uh, to take more into account multimodality. This is happening little by little, but in fact, multimedia by definition is multimedia. A lot of evaluation methodologies, either objective or subjective, are monomodal. And then you, know, you don't know, right? How do you fuse them? Some attempts are being done, but more is needed to be done. 3D, definitely, this is, this is something for audio and video. There is a lot to be done still. And until we don't really resolve this, I don't think that we can really come up with, with, um, with good solutions. Same is true with uh, new type of content, like high dynamic range. PSNR doesn't work at all for high dynamic range, even worse than 3D. And of course, the quality metrics for uh, assessing uh, the level of or the, the performance of, uh, of interaction and presence and immersion. This is happening more and more. Immersive multimedia is actually something a lot of people are striving for, a lot of applications, but we don't know how to measure it. Yeah? And how, if we don't know how to measure it, how can we optimize it? Of course, uh, there is a need also for certification. Once you have methodologies, you have to have means to actually certify that these, actually according to these means, these methods, these products, these uh, services are actually doing what they say. Well, this is my last slide. What does it all mean to us? Well, we have entered the area of user-centric multimedia, right? So one way uh, is to continue doing what we did, right? add new features, new functionalities, new services. I want to do anything, anywhere, anytime, any product, any, 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 any. All right? Or, well, let's first, even for some of the simple things, find out how we can um, uh, uh, augment the impact on the users rather than adding just complexity, adding just more things adding just more features, more bells and vessels to it. 
There are a lot of opportunities. I guess I don't need to tell you. Uh, definitely for some people like me in research, but also in other areas, including uh, yours. Uh, uh, lots of applications uh, that can be thought of, but also in art and entertainment. Thank you very much. <laughs>